Good turnout. Uh, it seems like we can almost predict the weather now when we Houston Audubon hosts the uh, speakers event. Usually the weather turns south, and luckily the weather will hold off, and tomorrow will be the best day. Um, did you know in the month of January, going forward, we have 32 different events that you can participate in? In February, there are 45 events on the Houston Audubon calendar. So if, if, if you're looking for something to do and you can't find it at Houston Audubon, I don't know what the, what's going on, but it's amazing how many events Houston Audubon does sponsor and host each month. And this is before we get to spring migration. So I, was, I didn't realize it myself, but then I did a count and looked at the calendar. So by all means, for all our events, please go to our website, HoustonAudubon.org, and there's a calendar, and they're all listed there. And it, it, there's a lot of diversity, a lot of different things, from kids to senior trips to everyday birding events. So, uh, like I say, 32 in January and 45 in February. So I won't bore you by going over all of each one of them events. In your seat, we have a new campaign called More Than a Membership. Houston Audubon is a membership-driven organization. Our members, every member is important to Houston Audubon. And if you're not a member, I encourage you to take a look and consider becoming a member. It's very important uh, to the organization and it's much appreciated by the organization that everybody's a member. And uh, Houston Audubon has an amazing reach in the region, not just in the city of Houston, but you're in up and down the Gulf Coast and it's a fine organization to be part of. I encourage you to do that. Uh, there's two people tonight I would like to recognize real quick. Uh, the first one, she's standing in the back and does, and she's going to run and hide. <laughs> she's recognize Juanita. Juanita has been with us how many years? Eleven. Eleven years, and she is retiring at the end of this month. And I'd like to get her run. <laughs> I'd like to uh, recognize is Captain Lee McGovern, who's here tonight, and she has uh, been an excellent uh, <coughs> sponsor of a lot of key things at Houston Audubon and the driving force behind a great improvement that we're making at Smith Oaks that will make the birding experience much more enjoyable for more people and give people that might have limited access tremendous access to a rookery, and we want to thank her for that as well. this point, uh, the raffle, we have a raffle. We are giving away a Houston Audubon 2020 patch for High Island. Mm. You guys have your tickets? Yes. The winning number is 734-853. <laughs> So, 2019 was the 50th anniversary for Houston Audubon, and it was a great year. We had a lot of really great things that happened in 2019 around the 50th anniversary of celebration. But I really feel strongly that it put us in a position for the 51st year to be even bigger and better. And what Pete's going to talk to us tonight about is the springboard into 2020 and 50, our 51st year. And you do a formal introduction, you Pete, so they know. Uh, Pete Dykeman, he received his bachelor's degree in biology from the University of Missouri in St. Louis. He's worked on several major projects. He came to us from Massachusetts Audubon Society. Uh, Pete has been known to be our, uh, he's our coastal manager operation. He's our general fixer-upper. He, uh, he always has duct tape and bailing wire handy. <laughs> and uh, on that, I'll introduce you to Pete. <laughs> All right, give me a second here while I figure out how this thing works. Hey, can I make a quick shout out while you're getting your stuff together? Sure. Does everybody know about the Wild and Scenic Film Festival at River Oaks on January 28th and 29th? It won't be only birds, 
but there will be some birds, and it's a really wonderful, what it's a series of short films, two evenings, River Oaks Movie Theater on West Gray, January 28th and 29th. You can get tickets ahead or through Citizens Environmental Coalition website, or you can just go to the movie theater and get a ticket. Okay. Um, and it's a series of short films, two nights. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, everybody good okay? And you turn it up or down. So thank you, Sam, for that wonderful introduction. I don't always have bailing wire on me. That's exactly I do. Make it up. So Break I'm it up, please. very happy to. It might be a little, need to be a little bit louder. A little bit louder? Okay, thank you. We can hear back here. Uh, uh. A little bit louder now. A little bit louder now. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'll just talk a little bit louder. Uh, so I'm very happy to be here today uh, to talk to you about everything that's going on in the High Island. You may have heard some rumblings that there are some big projects happening, so I'm here to talk to you about those. We have past and ongoing habitat restoration and conservation projects. We have some uh, brand spanking new nature tourism enhancement projects. And one thing I'd like you to keep in mind as we go through these is how they relate to Houston Audubon's mission uh, to advance the conservation of birds and positively impact their supporting environments. So to do that, we do two things. We want to help the birds and also connect people with nature. So briefly about Houston Audubon, we own, Houston Audubon owns 17 sanctuaries in five different counties, encompassing roughly 3,500 acres of property. Uh, most of those are open to the public, so helping to connect people to, the, to nature. And we do a lot of monitoring and research on those properties. Um, this is what I'm going to talk to you about today. Is about, this is a brief overview uh, about our High Island Master Plan, our restoration and invasive species removal, our rookeries resiliency and enhancement project, nature tourism enhancement, and then how that all fits into with the Bolivar Peninsula Nature Trail. So the Highland Master Plan, um, so 3,500 acres of property, 70% 70, 70 of that property that Houston Audubon owns and manages is down on the coast. And there is one full-time staff member <laughs> and three seasonal technicians for all that property. So we realized that we need uh, we need a, something in place to better manage those sanctuaries um, and build capacity so that we can make a more lasting conservation impact. So get your bearings, Upper Texas Coast, High Island at the base of the Bolivar Peninsula, everything in yellow is Houston Audubon property, four sanctuaries in High Island, Smith Oaks, Eubanks Woods, Gas Woods, and Boy Scout Woods. Uh, and it's managed as critical, critical stopover habitat for birds migrating during, migra during spring and fall. So during this whole highland planning process, I'm not going to go through all of these, but I just wanted you to know, we thought of you know, how all of our user groups and what their needs were, and further broke that out into how those needs are met by Houston Audubon properties in High Island, um, and then where we were lacking. So facilities in High Island, for unmet needs, we have the Smith Oaks Pump House. Anyone seen the Pump House at Smith Oaks? This old abandoned building that housed old pumps moving oil in and out of, in and out of the old, now defunct oil fields. Um, the Smith Oaks restrooms, anybody tired of using porta potties in Smith Oaks? <laughs> Well, I'm tired of cleaning those porta potties. <laughs> um, we have the field station on Fifth Street, which has seen better days. Uh, we have the new Hulsey Coastal Operations Center that is really helping us build out capacity. And then with the cottage on Fifth Street for housing for volunteers, work crews, and um, visiting researchers coming down to do research on our property. So this is the Hulsey Coastal Operations Center. Um, we realized we needed, we needed more space. 
for all of our equipment. We need more space for volunteers. We need more space for staff members. And this was an old energy services um, property. Uh, they went under. They have this beautiful 5,000 square foot hurricane rated storage building. Uh, and we basically purchased the property for what it would cost to build a new one of these. And it also came with a mobile home, which we were renovating. I'm gonna skip to this slide because it's nicer. So <laughs> wonderful storage building. Mobile home for their staff to house staff members. Install three RV pads to expand capacity for volunteers. One day build out a nursery for restoration materials, a nice little meeting space, and just overall beautification of the property. So a lot of those things are actually done now. Um, this was a room inside the, the shop building that we built out as laundry facilities and bathroom and shower for, all, for volunteers. Uh, this was a project done in partnership with UT Austin School of Architecture. Some grad students and their professor came down and built this screened in meeting structure for us. Uh, these are the RV pads. They look better than that now. Uh, and then we're working with a local Houston artist, Doug Heiser, to paint a mural on the front of this barn. So between this mural and this fancy structure here, those are the two fanciest things in High Island right now. <laughs> and so you can see this mural isn't actually done yet. And if you're not doing anything on Saturday and you have some artistic talents, we'd love you to come out and help us you know, finish out some of the grasses, some of the birds. Um, you can go ahead and send me an email, call me, catch me afterwards, and I'll, I'll, I'll let you know. So the field station on 5th Street, the current field station has holes in the floors. Um, it, it's, it's functioned well so far, but it's in its twilight right now. We need, um, we need a more stable space to use for, for not just for staff, but also for volunteers and visiting researchers. So this is kind of, we're working with a, a, an architect, an architect to meet some of those needs, so screened in porch, overlooking the barnyard, which if anyone's been recently, that nice lot next to the field station has been some of the best birding I've seen in the past three years. Um, some flex space, a kitchen, place for volunteers to store their stuff, office space, bathrooms, um, kind of better to bring us in line as you know a, a, a birding hub on the coast. So one of the things that's ongoing or non, it's, it feels nonstop and exhausting at times is the expansion and improving of habitat. So we are, if you ever go to the High Island in the off season, you'll, you're likely to hear the hum of a chainsaw in the maybe not so distance. Um, so we are out there removing non-native invasive plant species. So what is an invasive plant? Well, invasive plant is typically a non-native it's a habitat generalist. It has few to no natural predators and fast growing, quickly starts out competing native vegetation. And because it has few natural predators, it essentially can create a food desert for birds. Um, this list could go on for a long time. I'm only gonna pick two of them. Chinese privet was Originally introduced as an ornamental, if you've ever seen Chinese privet in the spring, it has a beautiful white flower inflorescence, creates a very nice hedgerow. It's beautiful, and that's why people brought it here, but it escapes cultivation very easily and soon takes over the understory of critical stopover habitat, creating that food desert, and we need it to go. Chinese tallow, many of you have probably heard of Chinese tallow, also an aggressive habitat generalist, originally introduced by the U.S. Department of Agriculture <laughs> to try and establish a, a commercial soap industry. That didn't work. Lots of different control methods, physical, um, biological, biological terrifies me. 
Uh, you introduce a little bug that will, will eat Chinese privet. What's it going to do when it gets here and finds out it actually likes something else here better? <laughs> and then chemical treatment using herbicides. So we're running under the assumption that invasive species are bad for birds. Um, and there's a couple different studies. This one in particular, Hudson Hanula and Horn. I'm going to show you a, a quick graph here. So what they did is they did Chinese privet removal and follow-up chemical treatment on five-acre plots. So I'll show you. So this, this first plot was their control. So Chinese privet infestation, they didn't do anything with it. The second one, they ground up all the Chinese privet and then herbicided all the stumps. This one, they just cut them a chainsaws, let them fall where they were, herbicided the stumps, and let nature come back. Um, and then this was plots where there's no history of Chinese privet invasion. So after five years, they went back and, and sampled the bee and butterfly populations. So the number of species per plot um, in the mulch and hand-felled plots where they removed Chinese privet, more than double the number of butterflies than found in control plots that Chinese privet was not removed, and bees also more than double, more in line with areas that have never seen Chinese privet infestations. And then the number of actual individuals of those species in the control plots where there was Chinese privet versus where Chinese privet was removed and where there was no history of Chinese privet. privet. And I'm talking about birds and butterflies, really I'm talking about bird food. So, several different methods that we employ, hack and squirt, we go out there with a, a hatchet and just kind of frill the edges of trees and stumps and fire beside to them. We, we're out there with chainsaws. That's our favorite tool. Completely cut the Chinese privet or Chinese tallow down, herbicide the stumps. It is very labor intensive. It takes a lot of time. And then we always have to follow up with foliar spraying. So backpack sprayers with herbicides to spray the sprouts. Most of our restoration work has been going on in Smith Oaks right now. Um, we, if you've gone birding in Smith Oaks over the last six years, you may have noticed that this area over here has kind of started getting a lot clearer. It's a lot easier to see through. Um, this area as well, maybe last year, this area. Now we're on to this area around Grapple Pond. It's, it's slow moving, but we're making progress. Um, in the past, it's been largely volunteer managed. Now that we have full-time staff on the coast, we can, we're, we're able to make a bigger dent. So our approach, complete above ground removal, followed by chemical treatment, followed by some pretty awesome privet fires. Um, <laughs> sometimes we just make brush piles. Uh, follow that up with supplemental plantings of native species to bring back, because we're completely removing the understory in some areas, so we have to put native trees and shrubs back into the system, and then follow up, spraying, re sprouts. What do you treat with? Uh, herbicides. What? Glyphosate. Um, if anybody wants to get down on this action, <laughs> uh, Saturday. Two days from now, we're having a volunteer work day at Enai Islands. We'll provide you lunch, we'll go out. We'll, well let's, go ahead. What are some of your favorite replants for, of natives? Live oaks, uh, magnolias, sugar berries, yopon holly, most of the stuff that we have in Enai Island. That, and a lot of times, as we're removing Chinese privet, we're actually finding some of things underneath that are getting choked out. Like this is a magnolia that I kind of fooled you. We didn't actually plant that. We found that underneath the big stand. <laughs> so 
come join us on our work days. We'd love to have you out and help us and get your, get your hands dirty and further the conservation. I have a humongous freak out problem with glyphosate, which you, you're saying that you're putting that there. Let's talk about that after. <laughs> So I'm going to move on from habitat restoration to the High Island Rookery um, Expand Resiliency and Enhancement Project. That's a mouthful. Um, so Smith Oaks originally reacquired in 1994. Um, every year after that, birds have nested on those islands in clay bottom ponds. So eight species regularly, neotropic cormorants, great snowy egrets, little blue tricolored herons, Cattle rips, black tie night herons, and rosy spoonbills. Busiest season is from about the end of February through May. Uh, the, it's also used year round as a roost for birds in the evening. So you come out an hour before sunset, take your seat on one of the observation platforms, and watch thousands and thousands of birds coming in from the surrounding areas to roost on the islands of, in that. Past management has been to regularly weekly monitor the, the roosting, uh, annual surveys for the nesting birds, um, man manage the nesting structures, rebuilding them when necessary, installing new ones when necessary, when big trees get knocked down. Every once in a while, a lonely raccoon makes it onto the island, we have to go out and move it and take it somewhere else. Um, they like eggs just like we do. I say we do a lot of invasive species removal, but the invasive species, Chinese tallow in particular, that are out on that river island, we leave that there. So it does not serve a purpose, and it's, it's, it's not beneficial anywhere else but there. It serves as nesting structure, and after a lot of the hurricanes that have taken down a lot of the big, tall, live oak trees, the birds need that structure. Um, and they're one of the few trees, because they're generalists, that actually can withstand all that bird guano. Uh, tree fire ants, and we also manage the water levels. So in 2011, during the drought, we, this is a historical photo. Um, in 2011, during the drought, we actually had to purchase water. We used to have them purchased water to fill, in, to put into clay bottom ponds. In 2014, the year after I started, this moat here was so low that you could actually see raccoon tracks huh. in the three, four, five inches of water going out to the island. So we pumped three and a half million gallons of water from Smith Pond into Clay Bottom Pond. So 2011, you can see all this dry ground. It's completely dry. Smith Pond, there was no water in Smith Pond that you could pump. Uh, Clay Bottom does not have any inflow. It's surrounded by a levee system. Smith Pond does have some inflow, so it flows off the prairies and down through a slough and into Smith Pond, which was historically the town's water supply. So, we had to come up with a better system than buy or pump three and a half million gallons every year. So working with DEU and with an award from the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, we came up with this plan to manage the water levels. So there's a drainage ditch that runs along the side of the driveway here that just dumps water out into this pond. Well, what if we trap some of that water, put up some control structures, dug a ditch across the prairie, and put it in the clay bottom. In the meantime, build a couple new rookery islands. So the red here in this photo are dredge areas, and the green is deposition areas. So we wanted to create an additional acre of island habitat as long as, as well as be able to help manage the water level better. So January 2018, this wild plan got underway. And this will kind of take you through some of the steps. So in January 2018, we started digging the ditch. Um, they had these big track hoe machines that actually floated and bobbed around in the water in order to do all the excavation in the ponds. Uh, cut through the levee system in order to install culverts that will direct that ditch, from, that water from the ditch into clay bottom pond. So by February of 2018, everything was pretty much complete. 
So we started building some artificial nesting structures. This is an eight by 10 flat platform. In March, we had volunteers on our workday. Coming up Saturday, please come out. <laughs> we'll be doing this. Um, playing, playing trees out there, because basically we just had a big <coughs> pile of dirt out there. So after May 2018, we weren't really sure if it worked yet. We had, we had these water control structures closed, or we were just waiting for rain. This is the ditch. Also in May 2018, all these trees we planted, we also noticed, well, we have some volunteer black willows coming up all along the edge of this island, so that's great. By the end of that year, by the fall of that year, we had rattle box completely covering the, island, the new island in Clay Bottom Pond. Um, this is a picture taken, me standing about five feet high on that, on that platform that I showed earlier. So we also installed some more artificial nesting structures in November 2018 with volunteers, this time in Smith Pond. By November, so about six months of Texas summer heat, we had this kind of vegetation response on this new island in, in, in Smith Pond. <coughs> January 2019, we had our first nesting pair of great egrets. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! I didn't fool you, did I? <laughs> yeah, the birds weren't fooled either. So we installed these decoys to try and track birds for the for last nesting season. Didn't work. Uh, one of the reasons that we think it didn't work is I'm gonna go back one. This island doesn't look like it should like birds should nest there. Uh, so November 2018 to November 2019, this picture was taken at almost the exact same spot on the islands looking the same direction. So this is just one extra year of um, vegetation growth. And this is me standing five feet high on another eight by 10 platform. So black willow had exploded well over 15 feet tall. All these artificial nesting structures that we put that were about that high, um, you know, completely overtaken. We're really hopeful this year. The predominant vegetation has been cattail, um, which has definitely helped stabilize that island. It was a little bit siltier than, than the other island in Claybottom Pond. And then the black willow, friendly neighborhood guard dog. <laughs> and that's the view from above. So we estimate about 10% left of just bare ground, which mostly we, we think that's kept open by the alligators. Um, the island in Clay Bottom, however, birds are nesting. We have neotropic cormorants. Uh, this was taken in November. Neotropic, nest neotropic cormorants nesting on the new island. One of our unintended positive consequences to being able to manage the water level is that we actually created additional habitat that we hadn't planned on <laughs> creating. So this was a peninsula that we had cut off here and dumped the dredge material to create a new island. Well, we created an additional four and a half acres of nesting habitat by being able to more effectively manage the water levels. So this is the graph of the water level. So original project, when we started, uh, this was about April, 2018, didn't get any rain, and then finally, So these are some of the data since the project. So total nest for all species is about average for the last 10 years. Neotropic cormorants. Okay, wait, that, that, that's like a significant drop. Can you go back to that previous slide? Like, what, what is that? What is the reason for that significant drop since 2004? It, it, we think it mostly goes back to nesting structure. So 2003, Hurricane Rita. 2006, Hurricane Humberto, 2008, or 2007, and then 2008, Hurricane Ike, knocked down a lot of trees. Um, so I'm gonna quickly run through these so we're gonna be, we're gonna stay busy a little bit. Um, Neotropic cormorants, average 184, 323 this year. Great egret nests, 
a little lower than average. Snowy egret nests, a little bit lower than average, but about average for the 10 year. Little blue heron nests, well above the average over the last 10 years. Tricolor herons, well above the average. Cattle eagle nests. Rosie spoonbills, significantly down. So summary and questions. We definitely created habitat and we stored the alligator patrols around, around the islands in, in Cray Bottom Pond. Um, the new islands, <coughs> new vegetation on them, so we're hopeful that this year we'll get some new nesters. We've definitely been able to effectively manage the water levels. Um, forest nesters, like little blue herons and tricolor herons, doing great. Little blue not quite as much. Yellow crown night herons, we had six yellow crown night herons, which we haven't had in the past. Um, no nests in Smith Pond. Um, one of the things we're curious about is the neotropic cormorants. So neotropic cormorants nest again in the fall. Uh, we don't know if it's again, but there's neotropic cormorants nest in the fall. So maybe there's just not enough time for that vegetation to recover. They're just beating all that nesting structure all year long. So it doesn't have time to uh, recuperate. So I'm gonna move over to some of the nature tourism enhancement that we're working on. So thank you to the McGovern Foundation for an award. Um, we've had a design team put together to come up with this 700 foot handicap accessible boardwalk, uh, re renovate our pump house, and also install bathroom, bathroom facilities in Smith Oaks. This is the architectural drawings. It makes a little bit more sense here. So right here is the pump house. This is where the planned restrooms will be. New Island Smith Pond and Clay Bottom and the elevated boardwalk. So Smith Pond, the trail around Smith Pond is roughly about 10 feet. The walkway will be 20 feet above that overlooking Smith Pond. The Clay Bottom Pond overlook will be roughly 13, 14 feet above the existing levee overlooking Smith, overlooking Clay Bottom. And these are some of the, the renderings from the project. Um, first phase, we're, we're not doing the windows and the doors yet. The, the, the pump house will be an open air pavilion, um, just somewhere to get out of the get out of the rain on those days when the, you know, we're praying for a fallout as the front's coming through and we're trying to dodge the, the lightning strikes. The elevator boardwalk will start right on the side of the pump house. So that's done? It's, it's planned to be done by spring, by April 2020, by April of this year. So those so were renderings, what you just showed? Yes, so it's currently under construction. If you go to High Island right now, it's a bit of a muddy mess in the parking lot. Um, and we have the trails a little bit rerouted, so you don't hurt yourself. Hurt yourself. <laughs> and this is all part of a part of a larger project that's in the mix uh, for the Bolivar Peninsula Nature Trail. Um, so there's basically to bring nature to a bigger, bring nature to the masses on the peninsula. Um, several projects in Port Bolivar, most of these projects are on Houston Audubon properties, and we're just hoping to get people more involved with nature. So special thanks to everybody <laughs> on this list.
Um, and any, anyone I, I forgot, special thanks to all the volunteers who come out to work with us and have helped putting a lot of these projects together. Any questions? wondering when you talked about the Chinese privet and it being a food desert you did show that the plant grows berries so are those berries just not very nutritious not very nutritious and they're full of uh, it's actually full of alkaloids so it's not so things like white-tailed deer won't eat Chinese privet um, as well as Chinese tallow it's the compounds in there are actually poisonous <coughs> so if you go to like its native equivalent I think it's Yopan Holly. You can go to Yopan Holly and you see holes and chunks taken out of it from bugs eat, eating it. You can go to pretty much any Chinese Chinese privet and you see a full plant, no holes, no nothing, completely intact. There was a note that said you removed predators. Was that plants only, or did that include the alligators? No, we did. We removed predator, bird predators from nesting islands. So raccoons, skunks, possums, um, not the alligators. We love the alligators. The alligators. The only time we have to catch a predator is when the alligators aren't doing their job. <laughs> <laughs> There was a marked decrease in the uh, nesting pairs for most of those species after 2003, 2004. Do you know if that is uh, coincident or similar? You, do you see similar counts all along the upper Texas coast, or is that something specific to high islands? You do see similar declines in bird numbers up and down the Texas coast. Um, this one in particular, I know that we did lose a lot of nesting structure because of a lot of other things we got during that time period. So when we do this count um, for the Texas Colonial, Water, Texas Colonial Waterbird Society, we're doing it from one observation platform here, and then four more here. We can sort of see through the trees a little bit here, and we can sort of see through the trees a little bit on the trail here, but we are missing a huge chunk of birds here that are all in their nesting that we can't see. So we can just get the best the best estimate we can this year in particular um, because the water was so high and parts of the original rookery, the existing rookery islands were flooded. There was a lot of birds that started moving over to here where we just couldn't really see them. Um, so we're, we have plans for the next survey to try and get a a better count by either using boat or going further around. Helicopter. Helicopter. Drones. 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 Always great for uh, birds. Also still hard to see through trees from a boat. <laughs> Pete, uh, it's been my experience that the spoonbills are the last of the water birds to nest. Mm. And if everybody else got in there earlier, yeah. there may not have been enough space for the spoonbills. And that is true. I like to think that great egress and snow egress having this big dagger they can poke and prod. Spoonbills can just kind of clap at you. <laughs> Can't really do anything. Uh, what kind of oaks are you, oak trees are you putting in? Uh, mostly live oak, water oak, um, bur oak, the things that are already there that we know do well. 